Hi everyone, my name is Bob Dietrich. Welcome to the ADHD Toolbox, your resource with helping your children overcome behavioral and learning challenges and helping them self-regulate. Um, today, I am super excited. I'm waiting for this interview because we're talking with Kevin Roberts and Kevin is a expert in, and, um, on screen addiction and how to help your children uh, with strategies to overcome screen addiction. Get them off those computers, get them off those phones and get them back engaged in life. So. Um, Kevin, welcome to the show. Bob, it's great to be here. And as many of the parents watching will certainly understand, uh, the screen, the cell phone, the video games, computer, these are things that regularly, most uh, times, uh, daily, cause conflict in families that have an ADHD loved one. So I hope I can give some practical tools to help people uh, more effectively deal with those issues. Awesome. So what, uh, what kind of tools do you think uh, you'll be adding to the toolbox today? Well, I think a lot of the tools are making screen really relate to one overarching principle, mm -hmm. and that's creating a family where there's a shared view that too much screen time is a problem. Uh, and the whole family is engaged because, you know, one of the problems that often results from having an ADHD child is that the parent will become a police officer. Right. A parent will become, you know, a screen, you're, we're a homework cop, we're a screen cop, uh, we're, you know, take a shower cop, the teeth patrol, you know, and uh, there are so many aspects of life that our ADHD loved ones struggle with that, boy, if we can get that screen one under control, we can certainly uh, reduce the conflict. Awesome. Uh, so awesome. I, I have, you know, if you'd like, you know, we can start with some simple things that I think everyone uh, should do and we can move on to some more complex stuff that requires uh, a lot more forethought. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, before we do though, uh, can we talk a little bit about how do we know if there's a problem? Like how, uh, do, you know, how do you know if there's a problem or not? No, I can't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, you're getting me, I, I'm, I'm in Kevin Roberts serious mode. Yes. And I, you know what I'm going to do? I, my, I'm going to turn my background sound on mute there. Um, but I am a comedian like you, and I've, I've done a lot of improv, and when I do presentations, I, I try to pepper them with humor because I believe that humor is something that creates openness in people, and I want right. people to be open to my ideas because the things right. that I'm going to tell you, uh, I believe in. So how do you know there's a problem? Well, you know, I am a specialist in helping ADHD people succeed in school, uh, and when people come to me with screen addiction, school is often... A problem as well and when right. people come to me for help with school issues the time on the screen is often a problem as well um, is your child deriving um, excessive amounts of satisfaction from the screen to the exclusion of other activities did your child used to play the guitar did your child used to play soccer and now he or she doesn't want to go outside after school because at 345 uh, Fortnite, the Fortnite clan that he's a part of is meeting online to play for four hours. Right. Um, so that's, I mean, that's sort of some of you out there who are familiar with the warning signs and the features of addiction. A lot of what I'm going to say is similar. Um, does your child, you mentioned at the beginning of the show, Bob, that you're one of the things that you're trying to do here is to help families help their loved ones self regulate self-regulation in so many areas of life is trouble uh, is a trouble spot for ADHDers if your child cannot self-regulate and cannot seem to cut back or uh, engage in screen activities with moderation this is another sign um, that there's a problem is your child um, having social skills issues and your child is preferring the screen because social interactions with other uh, children his or her own age are difficult. So are we pulling back from friends? Are we pulling back from family in favor of the screen? Now, a lot of people, when I go and do public talks, I got a talk coming up here, um, doing a series of talks in uh, the United Kingdom in early October. And anytime I talk to groups of parents, they always ask me, and of course, in the UK, they ask me, Kevin, how much time per day should my son be spending on his video games? They ask me questions like that. And you know, it's really hard to specify a number, but the number that I usually stick with, and it's a number that is supported by the American Academy of Pediatricians, 
-hmm. two hours per day, two hours per day. Now, when I say that, Bob, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, well, am I talking two hours on a video game? Is it two hours on Instagram? Is it two hours watching YouTube? Mm -hmm. Is, does the time, does that two hours count towards TV time? Well, you guys got to suss that out for yourself because there's no one unified um, program that's going to work for everybody. But what I can say is uh, when people come to me, there's usually one primary screen behavior that is uh, overshadowing all the rest. You know, it might be I had a young woman here last week and for her, it's uh, watching videos uh, of people playing this certain video game that she likes. She doesn't even like, she doesn't even need to play. She likes watching the videos. I know maybe, you know, Bob, to you and to a lot of the parents out there, that just seems incredibly odd. Right. You know, people say, you mean he's not even playing the game? He's just watching videos of people playing the game? And by the way, if that's the behavior, we find that this is one of those harbingers of more serious issues surrounding the screen. If, if worse, if it's so passive for us mm -hmm. that we're not even playing, we're watching other people play. Right. Um, are there emotional, usually angry outbursts when you try to deprive your loved one of screen time? That's a, and you and I both know, mm -hmm. uh, Bob, that's a big one. Right. Um, so do, does my personality change when I'm on the game? Does my personality experience significant alterations? Am I normally a happy-go-lucky, somewhat agreeable person normally? And then when I'm on that game, I become a rageaholic. Do I become somebody who has trouble managing my own anger? And that's a particularly great point because it gets to um, what you said about self-regulation. Because we're trying to help ADHD people, ADHD young people in this case, self-regulate and if i'm having angry outbursts because of my performance in a game that is not self-regulating and so you know we really want to pay attention to these things so i think those are really some of the um the biggies telltale you know, signs have right? i turned away from activities i used to enjoy have i turned right. away from family and friends am right. i having trouble in school that seems to coincide uh, with my excessive interest in the screen? Uh, do I experience emotional outbursts if someone tries to take away my screen time? And has my, and in general, has my interest field in people and activities uh, been shrinking in favor of the screen? Awesome. Well, um, so before we get into the tools then and strategies that you use to, to um, help parents manage their use of uh, the child's use of technology, let's talk about some consequences. So what are the consequences if we don't do anything? Well, you know, here's the thing. I mean, boy, this is a really broad topic, Bob. And as you can imagine, sometimes I do day-long seminars just on this set of topics right. because there, it, there's so much to mine. And, you know, before I say anything, Mm -hmm. When I go, let me just say to, to all you parents out there watching, when I give talks and seminars to parents or medical professionals or, or, or what have you, teachers, I find that it's more of a discussion that we have together because, you know, in so many ways, so many of you watching are already experts because you're dealing with this on a daily basis. And I like to say that what I'm doing is kind of helping to focus and center the conversation that a lot of us are having. A lot of you have probably tried uh, some great strategies that are already working for you that, and I, I wish we were, you know, I was able to hear some of you what you're saying. But let's talk about some of the consequences and in particular, let's talk about um, with an ADHD individual. Now, first of all, um, ADHD is a condition that's rooted in the size, shape, structure, and functioning and wave patterns in the brain. So it's rooted in differences uh, in the brain. Right. And so, um, you know, we have to take that into consideration and we have to say, okay, there's a neurological nexus that exists between ADHD and this, what we're calling screen addiction or excessive, you know, interest in the screen, whatever you want to call it. There's a neurological nexus because in any uh, addiction, um, you have a an, a compulsive desire to do a certain behavior 
and you have an impulse control disorder along with it. Yes, I have this, this excessive, almost uncontrollable urge to engage in this behavior or a substance, right. and I can't control it. Right. So, you know, the trouble is if I am exhibiting these kind of addictive tendencies, then it, it demonstrates one of the uh, scientific um, assertions that we know is pretty true. ADHD people are at an increased risk for addiction. So we worry if a child is exhibiting uh, this excessive interest in the screen at a young age, that that's, going, that's a harbinger of a addictive profile that's going to rear its head in a more destructive way down the road. Um, if you don't get this control under control as a parent, let's say it's a social skills issue. Well, your, your child's probably not going to develop his or her social skills. If we've got these angry outbursts that are regularly uh, occurring around the screen time or around your attempts to curtail screen time, then you, not regulating the screen is going to just, um, result in your child uh, being somewhat um, uh, slowed down in his or her trajectory of being able to self-regulate for him or herself. Right. Right. We think, and I'm involved in a study with Detroit Children's Hospital, we're examining the brains of young people who have excessive screen mm -hmm. tendencies. And I think that probably what we're going to find, and it's going to take a while for us to find this, is that the, that when we engage in excessive screen behaviors over a period of years, it, it has an influence on how the brain is developing. Mm -hmm. And so the brain has this inner gardener that sort of prunes back networks in the brain that are not being used and lets the networks that are being used flourish. Right. So I worry that those cerebral networks inside of the brain that are crucial to social interaction mm -hmm. that are crucial to social skills development right. are, are going to be underemphasized by the, we know that the brain, that this is the way the brain operates. The networks that are being used um, tend to flourish and the ones that are not being used tend to uh, be cut back, so to speak. And we, even if you think about dementia, we know that people who uh, in their later years stay mentally active, Right. Uh, whether it's crossword puzzles or the, one really interesting thing is learning a foreign language, learning new information, staying socially engaged. We know that these people are less likely to develop dementia right. uh, or have less uh, serious dementia related conditions. So um, I think there's, a, I mean, I, I think the consequences are massive. And then, you know, first of all, you know, I mentioned this concept of the neurological nexus. I'm going to, I want to elaborate a little bit on that because I think that that concept gets to the consequences. So mm -hmm. ADHD, and you know, some people call it the dopamine dependent hypothesis right. of ADHD. It dopa, that, that, that neurotransmitter dopamine is heavily involved in how we experience a sense of reward, a sense of satisfaction. Right. So, you know, right now, you know, we're starting to turn to autumn here in Michigan, where I live, mm -hmm. and the squirrels are starting to go, they're starting to move faster. And they're starting, you can see them scurrying around and they're collecting nuts. Well, if we examined their brains, we'd see that they had elevated levels of dopamine. Dopamine makes doing certain behaviors, gives us a sense of satisfaction, and it also helps to focus us. Well, the problem is ADHD people, we already suffer from an atypical way of experiencing that feeling of reward. That's why we zone out in class. If we find class boring, we have brains that don't um, help us pay attention through boredom, through low intensity situations. So, you know, as we, you know, that's what ADHD medication does. It helps us, our brains process dopamine more efficiently. And so we're able to pay attention to situations of low intensity, situations that we might find boring. So right. here's the thing. A lot of us, you know, we go through life and we're drawn to intensity and, you know, we struggle with the, the behaviors that we need to succeed in school, note taking, studying in small chunks, you know, mm -hmm. turning in homework, completing assignments, keeping track of assignments, all this kind of stuff. But when we find something 
that's screen related, there's something about technology that really turns on our brains. Well, guess what? All people want to feel their brains with that sense of being turned on, of being fully engaged. And when, when it's the screen that is that vehicle for feeling a sense of satisfaction, a sense of reward, a sense of full cerebral engagement, it has the potential to diminish the possibility for other things like school, like music, uh, like musical pursuits, like sports to engage us. So that's the problem. You yeah. know, it, it sort of narrows our uh, reward, our reward pursuits. And, and, and so as we're discussing that, you know, this kind of gets into a lot of the scientific literature around addiction. And that's where that's the neurological nexus. That's where ADHD and addiction uh, come in. And Dr. Joseph Biederman, who is you know with Harvard, Massachusetts General Hospital, he's done a number of studies over the years that pretty conclusively show that it's upwards of fifty percent of uh, ADHD adults who are not treated will struggle with substance abuse. And then when you add in process addictions like right. screen addiction, gambling, it becomes even greater. So I think the consequences are significant. And I think that the consequences warrant um, greater parental engagement. Awesome, yeah. And, and especially with a, a child with ADHD, right? Um, it, what it does is it takes that ADHD and it just amplifies the challenges they're having because it, it cuts off the, the social engagement. It cuts off, you know, it, it narrows in dopamine rewards, like you said. So. Now the, now the ADHD child is not reaching out and learning and starting to expand and overcome these things. They're starting to come in and they get narrow, more narrow and, um, and they really, uh, it really compounds the problem with ADHD. Yeah. Sounds like. That's okay. exactly, compounds the problem. I, that, that is a very great way of saying it. Yeah, all right. So, all right, well, good. That's really good to know. That's important to know. Um, so let's get into strategies. What are some of the strategies that you use that parents can actually um, start to put in place tonight i mean today what 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 can people start to use to help their child uh get off the screen get engaged in the family and start engaging in, in more life and social skills start building those those social skills like you were talking about well the first thing that i want to say mm -hmm. is it's incredibly easy for me to sit back here and give a lot of steps and strategies for parents to use right i i love it's so easy but the problem is implementing these strategies is incredibly hard, okay? Right, so right. the first thing that we need to understand. I'm gonna take some notes. And I, oh, I, I think if people out there should be taking some notes too, although you can go back and watch this video, but. Um, you can go back notes. and watch the video, Bob, and I'm gonna uh, also, mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna put a link in here and people can email me. I am making an offer to your listeners that I will email them a free copy of my ebook, which is called Get Off That Game Now, The Essential okay. Family Guide to Healthy Screen Behavior. So okay. you and anybody watching this video can have access to my book. And it's about 80 pages. And all the stuff that I'm talking about today will be in there. Mm -hmm. And it will also include, uh, there's a couple chapters on problems that families have uh, encountered and how I have counseled them to confront and mm -hmm. come up with strategies to solve those problems, number one. And I also talk about um, the nuances of implementing strategies, new familial behaviors. Right. Um, so, so we're going we're gonna to make that available. Um, you back. can, the title of my first book is called Cyber Junkie, Escape the Gaming and Internet Trap. And the reason I say that is because it's also my email. So if people email me, it's cyberjunkie, 512 at gmail.com and just email me there and I'll get you a free copy of Get Off That Game Now, The Essential Family Guide to Healthy Screen Behavior. Now, let me tell some stuff that, you know, families just right now this evening, mm -hmm. uh, they can uh, put in place. Okay. So first of all, first of all, um, before I say anything, let's understand that ADHD off for young people often feels like a giant finger pointing at you because so often in school and even at home, it feels like people are criticizing us. People are telling us there's something wrong with us. We're not doing things right. And so if you, 
if you're not careful, you're going to trigger, trip off the um, oppositional defiant tripwire that so many of us ADHDers have as part and parcel of our being. I have it. I'm a natural rebel. And so many of us are like that. So the first thing is parents, before you try to change anything, you got to get your own screen house in order, your individual screen house in order. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to do is to tell your kids that you're worried about your own screen usage and uh, tell them, you know what, uh, it's Saturday, kids, and I am, I am going to stay off my smartphone the whole day. And I want you guys to watch, and and because sometimes I can forget because it's it's so tempting to go to my phone. Mm-hmm. I want you guys to tell me if you see me on the phone. Mm-hmm. Now, what we're doing there is we're flipping the power dynamics. ADHD, yeah. ADHD people and ADHD young people, especially, we're very sensitive to power dynamics because so often we feel powerless in the school system. And we feel powerless over this condition because so many of us, we know we're smart. We know we can do it, but this condition gets in the way. So we have to be very sensitive to power dynamics. So I want you, first of all, to realize that any change uh, in your behavior, in your family, has got to start with you. Yeah, you that's to awesome. Now, if I you can that. find a way to let your kids catch you, then you're going to let them have power over you. That's very, very important. You have to, because... You know, so often, as I said, ADHD young people, they don't feel a sense of power. They feel powerless. And if you can look for opportunities to help them feel some power, man, that's a great way to start things out. Shift that power dynamic. Now, that being, so that's a great way. So parents, you have to get your own house in order. And I can't tell you, you know, I have meetings with families all the time. And uh, I would say it's probably... 75% 75% of the time, my meetings in my meetings with families, the parent will check the phone and will do something on the phone in the middle of the meeting. And I'm saying, well, maybe you got to look uh, you know, at yourself first before we go trying to tinker with the, life, the screen time of your child. Um, so that's the first thing. And you know, uh, if I can stop you here, that may be um, in, in all the interviews that we've been doing and all my studies uh, on ADHD, that may be a a through line through everything. It's like parents check yourself first. And yeah. that's sometimes hard to do. Right. Uh, but if yeah. we check ourselves first, uh, we're so much more empowered going into that. And because you know, we, we may find we struggle with the same things. I have a good, a good friend of mine lives in Phoenix, Arizona. His name is Tony Vizic. And Tony is a stand-up comedian. He, you know, used to do the comedy club circuit. He's not a, you know, Jay Leno or Jerry Seinfeld, but he worked as a comedian for many decades. And he's now a comedy teacher. And Tony and I have done a number of workshops Mm -hmm. um, with comedy and ADHD kids. And Tony uh, has come and seen the groups I do. I do school success groups uh, for ADHD kids. And he says, you know why it works, Kev? He, He said to me, he said, it works because you deal with kids like you're the first among equals you I this is what Tony tells me I guess I'm tooting my own horn but what the heck mm-hmm. um, I, I treat children with a, as if they're equal to me and I share my own struggles and my own challenges and I think that's why they listen to me now that's awesome. I am very cognizant that they also listen to me simply because I'm not their parent um, but 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 we, we have to be really careful because if we, if, if we model for our ADHD children that we're working on ourselves, man, nothing is better than that. Right. That, that. Then it normalizes it. Wow, my dad's working on his stuff too. My mom's working on stuff too. Right. It's all okay. You know, it kind of helps normalize things because so often ADHD children, they feel abnormal. They feel like, you know, gosh, something's wrong with me and I, I can never make up for it. And that's, and that's a whole other um, talk about shame and you know feelings of inadequacy. We can talk about that next time. Awesome. All right. But let's get to some. Let, so once we once we have taken care and please, people, if you're watching this, take advantage of sending me that email because this is very tricky stuff. And in watching something for thirty to sixty minutes, you might not have the nuances and the understanding to really put it into place because you you you, you might only get one bite at this apple. If you go into this and your parents, your children, 
you know, just put this into the, oh, dad's trying to control me again. Oh, here's some other, you know, area that I'm a problem. And you might only have one bite at the apple. So I want you to be very careful before you make any changes and very reflective. And I would love for you to get that book uh, because it's, it, it takes you step by step and it's real nuts and bolts. And a lot of this jargon that I've been throwing at you about neurological nexus and all, it's not in there. It's a very straightforward uh, book. So here's a, here's the first tip. Tech-free table. Uh, first easy step that you can do is dinner. Now, first of all, I am a little bit of a traditionalist in this point, and I think family dinners are very, very important. So maybe you're not eating as a family. So consider eating as a family. And if you only do it one or two nights a week, that's fine. Because everybody's going, you know, we're, kids are so overscheduled nowadays. But at least one or two nights a week, eat as a family and make it tech free. And that doesn't mean that you keep your phone at the table and nobody checks it because every book invariably somebody's going to check it. Put the phones in a bucket, put them in a drawer, lock the drawer, do, you know, make it, you know, exaggerated, but make sure that everybody knows that it's tech free dinner time. Um, because okay. if that, if just that one simple uh, move is going to create the uh, dynamic that, Hey, when we're eating together, we're not going to be on our phones because I mean, you you know, you go to the you know you go to the cafe or you go to a restaurant, people yeah. are on their phones. Gosh, I was out to dinner with a couple friends of mine, and there were two, there was a couple next to us, and they were obviously on a date. I mean, everybody in the whole restaurant knew they were on a date, and they were both on their phones back and forth. They seemed to be getting along, but you know, gosh, you know, this is this is what it's coming to. So, tech-free table is one of the easiest things that you can possibly do. And uh, it's a great way to start the process. And you may want to just start with that and, and see where that goes. Now, along with that, I like tech-free car rides. Now, the normal car ride for an adult with children is, especially once they start getting, you know, 10, 11, 12, uh, oh, hi, Dad. Yeah, uh, nice to see you. Put the earbuds in or the, the uh, what is the, what are the iPhone ones called? The uh, I don't even know. I can't even remember the iPods or I, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Put them in. Oh, and, and there's no talking. I'm just going to stay plugged into my alternate technology mediated reality. And I'm not going to talk to you. Try tech free car rides. And that's, a, that's also recommended in that movie screen agers, which is a pretty good movie. I think uh, about this problem, tech free car rides. Cause you know, so it's, we don't have time to talk to our kids. I mean, you know, the normal, you know, family life is kids go to school, they've got activities, there's also, we're taking them here, we're taking them there, we don't have a lot of time to really talk to them. So um, make the make the next step, potentially, a tech-free car ride. That's the time we're going to talk. No, you're not getting on your phone in the car, we're going to talk. Uh, novel concept. Um, so that's the second really easy step to, to do. Uh, the third step is uh, a tech-free room in the house. I mean, if you so if, you, if you've put these other, don't do it all at one time. Um, you may want to have a tech-free room in the house. That might be the family room. Uh, it might be the kitchen. But there's some room in the house where where people where you're not allowed to use your phone. Um, you know, the kitchen might be hard, but I have families that you know a lot of times they'll make it the family room, and that lends itself to. Uh, you know, watching a movie together or playing a game together or whatever it is. But you, so you see what we're slowly doing is we're slowly building these tech free spheres in our life. And you'll have to decide. I mean, some people don't have a family room, but you folks at home will have to decide, you know, what kind what areas geographically in your house you want to make tech free. Right. And we sort of slowly increase and expand uh, these areas. Got it. Uh, now, I'm going to also, you know, use the next step potential strategy um, to talk about the fact that I see a lot of young people who are sleep deprived. And I think that the quality of sleep is going down, down, down as the, the, the later and later, later use of technology. Right. So this one is a little trickier, uh, especially if you're dealing with teenagers, but I, in many cases, I have to recommend tech free bedrooms. Because so many kids, well, my, I got to have my phone because Kathy, it, it might be breaking up with her boyfriend. And if she, if she um, 
puts that out, if she tweets that out, you know, at three in the morning, I want to be able to get that. And mm-hmm. it's that, you know, the fear of missing out, the FOMO has become so powerful. Uh, and, you know, kids don't want to miss out. Uh, and there's something about, you know, being on the first, you know, knowing about it, you know, in the first kind of ring before everybody else finds out that kids get really plugged into and engaged. But a lot of these kids are, you know, they're going into their rooms, sure. And then they're staying up on their phones till one, two, three in the morning. They're, you know, I had a young man at my study group last night mm-hmm. and uh, we'll call him Marco. And uh, Marco uh, had bags under his eyes. I said, did you sleep last night? He said, no. I said, buddy, what were you doing? And he, the kids usually tell me, because I have a policy that unless there's great danger involved, I'm not going to tattle to the parents because then I would lose the open channel of communication. Right. So he told me, he says, well, I was watching YouTube videos. You know, he was watching, you know, some video game that he plays and he was watching people playing the video games and he just got engaged. And he was on for hours and hours and hours and he didn't sleep. And of course that impacts his, you know, here we're dealing with ADHD young people who have problems paying attention in school when, when the subject matter or the teacher is boring and low intensity anyway. And now we're adding to that. We're exacerbating it by not sleeping. So um, if you have a young person who appears sleep deprived, then I certainly think you should look to the phone usage. Now that, Go ahead, Bob. I, I, I'm long-winded, so please. Yeah, let me, let me interject here because a question comes up um, that seems obvious, and you probably were just gonna, about to cover it, but in the bedroom is often the laptop, maybe a television, and maybe an Alexa device or things like that. So we're t- if we establish a tech-free bedroom, are you saying move the, the TV out, move the, move the computers out, put them in the living room or something like that? Or, um, or you just shut, you take the phone away and shut off uh, those devices at a certain time. Well, you know, a part of this is going to be determined by the type of child you have. Okay. Um, but if you're like, like with this, with Marco, um, he was watching YouTube videos on his phone, you know, cause that's the most convenient. It's easy for them. Right. Um, you know, people of our generation, you know, we might not really want to watch videos on a little tiny device. These kids are totally uh, content with that. But if we took Marco's phone, I'm pretty certain he would just open up the laptop if he had a laptop in there. And I don't, um, I don't recommend TVs for the bedroom anyway, for kids. I just think it's a, I, in general, I think it's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's uh, cause you know, this is, this gets into a whole set of issues that we could do like three hours on and the, the problem is if we interdict their access to technology, kids are remarkably resilient, creative, uh, and intelligent at finding ways around our interdiction. So, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, if the iPad's in there, they're going to go for the iPad. And, and, you know, there are cases where kids are doing really poorly in school and parents will take away the cell phone because that's often the only motivational carrot that the parent of an ADHD child has. Right. And then I can't tell you how many times that the next thing we find out, that kid has a friend at school named Jimmy, and Jimmy just got the new iPhone, and Jimmy doesn't know what to do with his old one, so he gets Jimmy's iPhone and then manages to connect it to the Wi-Fi at the house and manages to get keep the phone in the bedroom and keep the technology use going all through the night without with parents being none the wiser. So, I mean, I'm sure a lot of the parents who are watching have already, many of you have done some of these, um, tech, I call it technology interdiction techniques. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that often has to happen is we have to shut down the router at night. Um, you know, if we're going to have any hope of um, curtailing their usage, we got to shut it down. Now, let me tell you, I've had kids get a friend's router and, you know, be able to circumvent that. Uh, I've had kids who figured out like a neighbor will have an internet network and um, they'll get on that network because they don't have a password. They get on their hotspot on their phone, right? Yeah, I had one 14-year-old and the next door neighbor was an older woman and he found out that she didn't know how to use her computer. So he offered to help her. And of course the parents were like, well, isn't that wonderful? 
So he got her password. And then, I mean, it, it, it's, it's unbelievable. He got, not only did he get her password, he put a signal enhancer on the side of her house that was near their house. Oh, boy. And he was plugging in her internet. Uh, and th the reason we found out is he was doing illegal downloading. So the, the lady got this notice and she took it to the father. And he's like, I think I know who's doing this. But <laughs> I mean, that just goes to show you how remarkably inventive right. Right. Uh, these kids are. So, but, but back to the point is that, you know, we, we were talking about screen time in the bedroom or uh, tech free in the bedroom. And uh, so if you have the computer, do you recommend taking it out of the bedroom or just being, yeah. yeah. Okay. So take that I out mean, of the bedroom. If you know, you're not sleeping, right? I, right. You, yeah. you know, I, I recommend using the Ronald Reagan approach that he used with Mikhail Gorbachev. It trust, but verify Mr. Gorbachev. That's what Nancy says. So I, you know, I, you got to trust you, you, you need to trust your kids, but you also have to verify. Um, and you know, there's a lot of different things you can do. You know, I mean, so what I, one of the things I was going to say around the tech free bedroom is that it can be important you know, nowadays, if you're the, you know, account holder for your, mm -hmm. uh, smartphones, you can download an app that allows you to control everybody's mm -hmm. phones. You know, right. you can just shut it, you can just shut it down. Um, and if you're tech savvy enough out there, parents, it's better that you shut the phone down than you physic than you have a physical uh, battle, you know, or I mean, a, a conflict to get it, you know, right. because this just, you know, ADHD okay. people, our lives are often filled with conflict, and you know, there's something called the brain's negativity bias, where the brain is more active under right. negative stimulation than when under when it's under positive stimulation, like joy, happiness, contentment. And a lot of ADHD people, we get addicted to negativity. So we kind of, there's a part of us deep down that likes the conflict unconsciously. So we want to try to avoid any conflict uh, ridden dynamics. So try parents. So that was my next step. Try, um, you know, go to your cell phone company. Um, I mean, there are videos, there are tons of videos. You can, you can, you know, let's say you're with Verizon, um, you know, call Verizon. They're, they're more than willing to walk you through steps. There's videos on how to you know control and manage your kids' phones, just put stuff into YouTube, and that's another thing you can find. You know, any little there's all sorts of videos out there of parents you know working hard to curtail their children's yeah. screen times. Yeah. But the problem, but the overarching thing is they're remarkably inventive and uh, resourceful at circumventing your efforts. Got it. Got it. Please. So we're almost out of time, but you had mentioned something uh, to me, and I'd really like. Uh, the people watching to uh, to to understand this. You you were talking about screen fasting. Yep. And uh, I love that idea. Uh, and I was hoping that you could share it with us, and then we'll we'll wrap things up and and um, and we'll go from there. So, what is screen fasting? And how does that work? And and how effective is that? Well, first of all, um, before you try to you know introduce the idea of a screen fast to your family, you as the adult have to do it yourself. Okay. And again, it's most effective when you can get your children to buy in to helping you with your fast, and then you can deliberately use your phone and let them catch you, you know, and you can even give yourself a consequence or something. Okay, if you guys catch me using my cell phone, you know, I'll take the trash out this week instead of you or whatever, you know, or right, we'll, right. we'll go to the Dairy Queen or, or whatever, right. you know, it is. Um, but so if you're, so a tech fast is a screen fast, tech fast. There are different ways of doing it, but you know, one easy way is you just okay Saturday morning no no technology, and that might be um, the day when you plan a family activity. Maybe you all go to the food bank and work at the food bank, or maybe you all go to the you know we have a great animal shelter here here called the Cat Fay, and maybe you all go to the Cat Fay and do some kind of volunteer activity. But there's a lot of ways to do it. I have families start with doing a morning, you know, often a Saturday morning. Or some people will go straight to a whole day. But regardless of how you do it, and this is all in the book, Get Off That Game Now, The Essential Family Guide to Healthy Screen Behavior, and it, it, two chapters of it walk you through this. But if you're going to try as a family to go 
with through a screen fest, start yourself as a parent. And then if you're gonna do it, you gotta plan out your day because if you just think you're gonna cut access to technology and then everybody's gonna happily mope around the house because they quote unquote have nothing to do, no, you've gotta plan out the day. So that, again, it might be the day that you do some kind of service activity as a family. It might be a day that you're gonna go, uh, I had a family, there was an elderly neighbor who had trouble taking care of her yard. They picked the day and it was a it was a four hour window and they all went over and did yard work for this this elderly lady because right. you know part of, so a lot of the a lot of what i recommend is um engagement with the community because the extent to which we're plugged into screens is is the extent to which we're sort of preferring screens and technology to people and i think we have to turn that equation around and get our kids more engaged in the community more engaged with others and helping other people and if we're dealing with ADHD people, we're almost always dealing with issues of self-esteem. I feel bad about myself. I feel inadequate. I feel there's something wrong with me. So if you can find a way to help your child feel good about him or herself, that's a great thing. And often if, I, if, you, if you can help us help others, find a way for us to be plugged in and help other people and make a difference in other people's lives, not only can we make that a screen-free activity, but we can also make it a self-esteem boosting activity at the same time. It's powerful, powerful stuff. So if you guys email me um, at cyberjunkie512 at gmail.com, I'll send you that, that book. And it's got a couple chapters in there. Don't go into it lightly. Read the book. Um, you know, I regularly coach families on this. Some families just don't feel they have the resources emotionally to do this and they need some uh, some support i do that as well but i'm happy to send you the book it's not an easy thing but it's a very effective thing if one, once you do that screen fast tech fast whether it's for a morning or an afternoon or a whole day it, it can help your family bond because you know part of it is we sort of plan out the day and we plan activities that we're going to do together so it can be extraordinarily powerful bob i've seen it transform uh, you know, the relationship to technology of entire families, and I've seen it bring families closer together. Fantastic. That is awesome information. And I'll bet there are dozens more uh, strategies uh, in your book that, that you're asking people to download. Uh, we're also going to put a link on this page. So there's a link on this page with a button. You just click on that button, and it will um, take you right to the download. And um, uh, you can go from there, too. Uh, but I, I encourage you to email um, Kevin, he has tons of information. And if you have any questions, just drop him, drop him a quick email and uh, engage. Uh, so this is a really big topic, Kevin. Uh, and thank you so much for being on the ADHD Toolbox. This is a great tool in the Toolbox and uh, something that nobody else really uh, is covering. So I appreciate your contribution. And, um, and thank you so much. Again, Kevin Roberts, uh, can you give us your email one last time, Kevin. Cyber Junkie, C Y B E R J U N K I E 512, Cyber Junkie 512 at gmail.com. Got it. And uh, one last thing before we go um, is that Kevin's written several different books. The one that, 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 um, that caught my eye uh, wasn't Cyber Junkie and it wasn't uh, Getting Out That Game Now or, or some of the other ones that he mentioned. It was Schindler's Gift. We're talking about how Oscar Schindler um, had ADHD and how he was able to uh, work around that and, and organize people that helped him create the result that he did. It's a fascinating book. I, I encourage you to download that and check it out. Um, so Kevin, thank you for your contribution to this ADHD community and thank you for, uh, for your contribution today to the ADHD Toolbox. My absolute pleasure. And if people do get Schindler's Gift, at the end of every chapter is a section called Raising Schindler. If you have a child who has some of the negative traits that he did, how can you effectively parent that child to help him or her succeed and make a difference in the world? Bob, thank you. I hope I've added to the discussion and I look forward to hanging out with you again. Oh, you sure have. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Take care, everyone.